this is Carlos Pascual, and welcome to this version of Serweek Conversations brought to you by IHS Market. This is an exclusive series designed to bring you insights on issues related to energy, technology, politics, finance. And today we're going to focus on a set of an integration of all of those issues on Latin America, on Latin America and its era of discontent with a question mark, a, a critical question mark. Latin America is, in, in, is a region with people, resources, finances that have huge capabilities, the capacity to raise its people up to middle class. And yet at the same time, it has struggled through COVID as the rest of the world has, but the recovery has been a challenge. And many times it's been expressed in discontent and political discontent. And we want to understand how deep is it? How structural is it? What are the opportunities to move out of it? And what are the kinds of choices that policymakers can make in order to be able to address the, the political directions that their, their countries are taking? And in order to have this conversation, we have an absolutely phenomenal panel. To begin with, um, Shannon O'Neill, who's the Vice President and Senior Fellow for Latin American Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. Shannon, pleasure to have you as always. Thanks so much for having me. And then uh, Mauricio Cárdenas, who's the visiting senior, visiting senior research scholar at the Center on Global Energy Policy at Columbia University, and who also happened to have been the Minister of Energy and at a different time, the Minister of Finance in Colombia. Mauricio, great to have you here as well. Thank you, Carlos. Great to be here. Very good. And finally, Ricardo Hausman. Ricardo uh, currently is the Rafi Kariri Professor of Practice of International Political Economy and the director of the Growth Lab at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government, and previously Minister of Planning in Venezuela in a different era. Uh, Ricardo, great to have you, and thanks for joining the conversation. Thank you for the, the opportunity. Looking forward to this discussion. Very good. So I'm going to start with a block of questions related to discontent and helping to understand it. And, and Ricardo, particularly with everything that you've been doing in the Growth Lab, I want to start with you. Is there any country in Latin America that doesn't reflect this era of discontent or these tendencies of discontent? And what's driving it? Well, I think, uh, you know, to a first approximation, everybody's suffering from discontent. I guess it's understandable. First of all, uh, for many countries, including Colombia, Ecuador, this is their worst recession ever. Uh, for other countries, this is the worst recession in at least a generation. So, so it's a really bad economic situation. It's a bad economic situation that is happening in the context of the region. So it, internationally, it's a region that did very, very poorly. It's a region that did worse in 2020. And number two, it had very, very tough uh, um, um, uh, uh, social distancing policies, uh, lockdown policies, uh, the, the, the toughest in, in the world, actually in terms of reduction in mobility uh, to work, increase in mobility and, and staying at home, et cetera. Uh, and so, so very tough uh, social distancing policies. And number three, very ineffective social distancing policies. Uh, it has had uh, you know, really bad, bad outcomes epidemiologically. Um, so so you know, it's, it's not just a recession, it's a social distancing, it's the ineffectiveness. Um, you know, we know that um, countries are very, very uh, differentially vaccinating. But one of the things about vaccination is that the, the payoff in terms of containing the pandemic are nonlinear and backdated. So you only get really the benefits when you get to really, really high rates of, of, of vaccination, which we have only seen in, in a couple of countries in Chile and Uruguay. Uh, all the others are still struggling with social distancing and so on because, because of that. But, but you know, uh, political um, political discontent is sometimes uh, it just gets channeled through political processes. So some countries have elections, and that's the channel through which these things are get expressed. Other countries have you know constitutional reforms, and that's how these things get expressed. Uh, in countries that don't have the the the, uh, the possibility of giving it a political a mode of expression, then, then things become a little bit more problematic, say like my own country in Venezuela or like Nicaragua and so on. So let me stop there. Um, political expression is clearly good. Shannon, um, if you could pick up on that. Does, 
does it also have a risk that it dooms the region to populist politics? Mm -hmm. Well, this is interesting because we see that populists, particularly in the two biggest economies and Mexico and Brazil have performed terribly uh, during this time, right? They have the highest number of official deaths and, and definitely the highest number of unofficial deaths and hospitalizations and the like. So they've had the hardest time in dealing with COVID in, in many ways because they're populist, because they don't believe in the institutions of government and working through processes and the like. So I think it's gonna be a rough ride for those two populists in particular as they look at elections coming up. But we just saw AMLO uh, in the midterm election, some constraining factors there. And then in Brazil, Bolsonaro will face elections in the year to come. And you know, worldwide, we've seen populists uh, perform quite poorly in, in a COVID era, whether that's India or the Philippines or, or some other places around the world. So I think Latin America, we see that. The challenge is I think we're gonna see an anti-incumbent uh, type of elections and we're seeing that already in, in some of the elections, Peru being one uh, recently, and I think we'll see those as elections roll out. And the, the real challenge over Latin America is some of these populists combined with COVID, combined with the recessions, combined with some of the other, other things that are happening in the region, the discontent in the region, is that we've seen an erosion of a lot of democratic institutions. So who comes after these populists is, is really unclear and could be yet another flavor of an anti-government, anti-establishment, um, anti-institution type of actor type of president. And that leads to, to real challenges for business community, for, for multinationals who are trying to work there, and, and frankly, for the voting population who want public services de delivered, who want various things from their government to make their lives better. So Mauricio, if you can pick up on that, I mean, in a sense, Shannon lays out this whole range of issues that, that bring a challenge to fiscal prudence and how you govern a country and how you set the economic framework to go forward. In this kind of environment, does, it become, does fiscal prudence become irrelevant? Does it become possible to pursue? Is, can, it, can it stand up to the political challenges that are being faced? Well, it's one aspect to consider, but it's certainly not the only one. So we talk a lot about fiscal sustainability, the need to keep public debt below certain limits, but that doesn't really solve all the problems. Uh, countries that are very well behaved in that front, like Peru or Chile. Well, today we're seeing a new president being sworn in in Peru, with a program that is essentially writing a new constitution, renegotiating uh, contracts with foreign companies, uh, um, in, in some sense, some read what Castillo wants to do as, um, as, the, as, a, as a government that would like to control, again, all the assets related to extractive industries anyway. So it just shows that you can have a low public debt but that's not sustainable in a broader sense because then it brings you know, a type of political and social reactions that make the whole economic structure, the economic institutions unsustainable. And similarly in Chile, uh, another case of a low public debt country, which is now rewriting its constitution by an assembly that is really formed by people that are very radical and no, one's really, no one really knows what's gonna come out of it. So the point is too much emphasis on low public debt and fiscal sustainability can actually backfire because it can bring in some unrest that makes the essential economic institutions unsustainable. So I think a balance is perhaps uh, the right approach. So the way out of this crisis is not really about uh, restoring um, the, the, the fiscal balance and lowering public debt the, the right approach is, is also, I mean, it's technocratic in a way, but it's mostly political. It's about really having the capacity to bring in into the conversation uh, sectors that are not well represented in our countries that, are, that haven't really been part of the political process. Um, Ricard, did you wanna pick up on that, on this point of bringing in sectors that haven't been represented? You've been studying these issues of inclusion and of economic growth. Um, and yet Latin America still suffers from vast inequality. Uh, strategies, suggestions, and ideas of what makes that viable? I think that the most important thing to know about inequality in Latin America is, is that it's not so much about sharing of the pie, how is the pie being shared, as it is about uh, 
pies of very different sizes being cooked in different parts. That is, there are some people who are in a relatively modern economy um, with uh, you know one standard of living, and then there's people who are say in the informal economy and. In, uh, in in uh, in a different economy that are baking very small pies at very low productivities, so uh, uh, inclusion is not the same as redistribution. It's not here is a, a a handout to compensate you for your exclusion, but the question is, can we have the wherewithal to include you in a in a more uh, expanded modern economy? And that requires uh, you know, a different set of actions. It's, it's not the distributive policies, it's inclusive policies, which may be very expensive. It's about you know, the structure of cities uh, and you know, you know, the poor live in, in you know, very far away from good jobs and, and the structure of, of transport infrastructure and security and, and so on and so forth. Um, so I would say a, a, an inclusive agenda is growth promoting. And, and it may be as expensive or even more expensive than a redistributive agenda, but it's not palliative, it's curative. And I think that that's where, where things need to go. Um, a very good point about making the difference to curative um, solutions. Shannon, one other point to put on this era, this, this issue of discontent, security. Has it played itself out in greater insecurity, um, both at a personal level and a national level? Security is, is a huge issue for Latin America and the region holds the infamous distinction of being the most dangerous region in the world. So it has less than 10% of the global population and it has one third of all homicides. Uh, and it is a region that does not have an active you know, wars happening. So this is really a challenge and other kinds of crimes too are, are incredibly high in, in many of these countries and not just particular countries, but really spread, spread throughout the region in, in different ways. We saw a bit of a decline at the beginning of the lockdowns for, because of the extreme social distancing and, and, and people getting locked up, but, but now rates are climbing back up. And that is a real challenge. And really very few governments have been able to get their hands around this and find a way to provide personal safety to people. And that is something you look at what voters want. Part of their discontent is they and their families don't feel safe walking down their streets and so the day-to-day -day business that they, that they do. And so I think this is, as we look at the agendas for Latin American countries and economies going forward, this is going to be a big issue. And it's a big cost to the inclusion that Ricardo was talking about because you know, people end up in the informal economy, people end up less productive when there's a huge cost of providing security uh, for, for bigger corporations or people are, or corporations are, hard, are afraid of becoming targets if they get too big, if they formalize, if they come into, you know, into a much more high profile position. And so they stay back and they remain less productive. So this goes hand in hand with the economic growth that people are searching for, as well as the political discontent that we're talking about. Let me transition from these issues of the discontent and the factors to the recovery. And Mauricio, if I could start with you and, and, and just start with the basics, the issue of vaccines and its distribution. Is that working? Is it creating polarization? How critical is it to the recovery process? Well, it's central. I think the, the recovery will depend on people getting vaccinated, the number of cases and the number of deaths declining. And that's what's going to you know, bring people back to the streets and, and, and uh, reigniting the economy. So the issue of vaccination is, is critical for the recovery. The issue of vaccinations is also very revealing of what's wrong in Latin America. Everyone talks about the two-speed world, how the advanced economies were able to get the vaccines uh, whereas uh, countries like Colombia, where I'm right now, uh, we're now about 50 percent, uh, 50 per hundred individuals getting a vaccine doesn't mean that they're fully vaccinated. But that's where the U.S. or the U.K. were back in March. So that, that type of delay shows something. So what's what's behind that? And I think it's one aspect of it is ineffectiveness on the part of the public sector. Uh, our public sectors are too constrained. Uh, they, they, they don't take risks. Uh, they don't want to invest in areas where um, things can go wrong. And that affects everything. I mean, that affects uh, you know, many opportunities for growth, inclusive work, uh, inclusive growth. Um, 
The vaccines issue also shows um, difficulties in terms of logistics, uh, inability of the state to reach out every single region, municipality of a country. Uh, that also shows how weak the state is. So in a way, this is, this is a good example of uh, what's wrong with the state in Latin America. And I think we need to resolve the issue of vaccines, but beyond that, we need to think about how to strengthen state capacities. But no doubt that rolling out the vaccines is going to be fundamental, and that's gonna happen between now and the end of the year for the recovery. So I'm a little bit optimistic about the recovery this year in terms of growth numbers, precisely because of that, because uh, uh, the number of cases is gonna come down, people are gonna feel more confident about going back uh, to, to work, going back to restaurants, hotels, et cetera. And I think that's gonna be a very important part of the recovery here. A critical point that you make, I think, on the issue of public investment and what to learn from the vaccine process and a critical need for that public investment to deal with the kind of inclusion issues that you and Ricardo had talked about earlier. Uh, Ricardo, um, let's take it from a different perspective here on the international side. And, and your answer may be that the international players don't matter. Um, and I'm also particularly curious about two international players, China and the United States. China, which has been increasingly involved in the region, and the United States, which um, let's just say has been more involved at different times. Um, how big is the role of international players in somehow affecting or guiding the way in which this recovery and this discontent might actually be playing itself out? Well, first of all, uh, you know, we can all point to, you know, the dark sides of, of the situation, but, you know, on the positive side, you know, there's a terms of trade boom for a lot of uh, South America, at least. Uh, commodity prices are up, uh, um, coffee prices are up. I just read an article from Mauricio on how important is, uh, you know, some of the things are increasing in coffee prices that are due to a negative supply shock in Brazil, but um so 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 commodity prices are up uh, and and capital markets have held up that uh, you know uh, countries have uh, been able to borrow at a fairly reasonable rate so they haven't been able they they haven't had uh, you know to deal with uh, you know a sudden stop in capital flows and so on and that that makes things more manageable uh, you know, there is a thing in the horizon that uh, uh, China has become the largest uh, destination market for South American products. Um, and, uh, and there is an increasing tension between the US and China. So there's one reason why Latin America should be strongly anchored on, on the US and the Western Alliance and, and the European Union and so on. It's sort of like our natural world. Uh, we tend to be more complementary with uh, needs, uh, the import needs of China. And that's a challenge that the region will have to manage. Uh, um, and it's, it's going to be a feature of many countries in the world uh, um, that it's just that China is going to be the main importing country in the world. And, uh, and it's going to color or and even limit the kinds of conflicts that uh, can be engineered between between the US and China. Shannon, a, a natural transition to you. You've just written a book on supply chains. Is it out yet? Not out yet, beginning of next year. <laughs> okay. Beginning of next year. Do you want to give us a title? Uh, it's called The Globalization Myth, Regionalization and How America's Neighbors Help It Compete. OK, write that down, everybody. <laughs> um, so back to this issue of supply chains. Based on what Ricardo had just said, on international trade. Is there an opportunity here for Latin America? There is an opportunity. And you know, one of the biggest shifts we've seen in the last year or so is the return of or rise of industrial policy and particularly in the United States. And under the Biden administration, we're seeing a whole rethink and I think down the road, rejiggering of strategic supply chains. And so the administration just released a 250 page report, which is somewhat of a blueprint of where they're gonna go in four strategic sectors. And part of that involves reshoring. There's some protectionist measures within there, but part of it means reaching out to allies and there Latin America is well poised to take advantage. You know, Latin American nations, most of them are longstanding 
geopolitical allies of the United States, as Ricardo was just saying. Uh, they is the area or region of the world that has the most free trade agreements with the United States. So the rules are already easy for imports and exports from the United States to most of the countries within the region. Uh, and Latin America has a lot of already capacity for the kinds of issues and areas that the United States is thinking about, whether it's critical minerals, things like lithium and cobalt and copper and graphite and things like that. Um, it is also a place where you already see a lot of pharmaceutical capacity. Both Mexico and Canada are the biggest uh, exporters of pharmaceutical agreements to the United States, much more than China already. So as the United States tries to protect its pharma supply chains, the region is a place where they can turn. We also see capacity in South America. So I do think as the United States looks to bring supply chains into a more secure area, they're going to look more closely at home. Proximity is going to matter. So things aren't an ocean away when you're creating stockpiles, you're creating excess capacity that's ready in a time of crisis. And the region is a place to turn. That will, though, depend on the politics in the region and governments and companies in the region wanting to participate in the supply chain. Right. So the opportunity is there, but it's not an automatic uh, something that's going to happen if you don't see a response from the region and really active policies from countries in Latin America to participate in those supply right. chains. Right. An, an opportunity to be, to be grasped if there's a willingness policies behind it. Um, Marisha, I wanna, one other thing I wanted to touch on is energy transition and climate change, something that you lived in as the um, Minister of Energy in, in Colombia and you've been very active on. And Shannon, I'm gonna come back to you on this as well. But is that an, an area where that creates opportunity? Absolutely. I, well, first of all, I'm delighted to see that we are all working on that topic. Shannon, just put out a paper at, in Bloomberg. Uh, Ricardo wrote his last op-ed in the Project Syndicate on the same topic. I've been writing on those issues at the Center, Energy Center at Columbia University. Um, and um, I think this connects with what Shannon was saying about opportunity in terms of like new, new sectors, new areas for investment, new areas of collaboration between the US and Latin America. So my view here is that uh, Latin America uh, is in a unique position to really advance the energy transition. Uh, but that requires capital. And that capital should come from the US, very much in connection with what Ricardo was saying about the China-Latin America relationship. Um, Latin America is not really part of the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, it should be part of a new approach, a new initiative promoted by the Biden administration to really deploy capital. Uh, concessional capital and the multilaterals can play an important role here. The development finance corporation should actually be um, a key player and um, and the region, um, well, the region is engaged in the climate conversation. The region is very ambitious in terms of uh, the reduction of emissions, in terms of uh, reaching net zero, uh, but it really lacks more, more capital to um, electrify transportation, to uh, build new energy projects that are clean, um, also to make sure that we preserve our rainforest, the Amazon, we need to monetize on the Amazon. Um, so I think opportunity here and really a, um, something that connects very well with the US interests. So this is, this is a great area to pursue. And I'm really happy to see that we are all working on that topic. Important points to make. Um, we can keep talking about this issue for a long time, but I want to get a quick snapshot on a few countries before we go, and we have a little bit less than 10 minutes. So um, just a, a quick snapshot on these issues, um, national politics issues. And Ricardo, I'd like to start with you. Um, Brazil, uh, Bolsonaro up for re-election in October of 2022. What to expect? Well, if you look at the betting markets, they swung. Uh, they, they swung betting that Bolsonaro would be re-elected to betting that uh, Lula will be re-elected. So, so you might see a, a swing at the, in the top job. But the interesting thing about uh, Brazilian democracy is that it's been sort of working, uh, that you know, you've been able to get uh, laws out of Congress through a complicated negotiation process. And I, I, don't, I don't see a major change necessarily at that level. So I think that there's a policy anchor in Brazil uh, that is provided by the fact that uh, you have democracy, you have a Congress, and you have a Congress that is relatively powerful. Ricardo, interesting perspectives. Shannon, if I can bring you back into the conversation on energy and climate, because in so many ways, 
it has become a cross-cutting political issue hitting in, in very central political circles in many countries. Can you talk to us more about the challenges and opportunities? You know, what I would add is, is I think there's great opportunity for Latin America in creating that green energy or that, that infrastructure and there's money that can go into it. I would also add that you know Latin America has a head start and that it has a pretty green set of electricity grids and energy matrices. There's a lot of renewable energy there already. There's a lot of bounty that they could tap into. And one of the things that that would do is not only bring money in and jobs and, and, and economic growth because of the creation of the infrastructure, but it would also provide a place that all kinds of international companies could go to put manufacturing and other things that aren't necessarily directly tied to green technologies or green infrastructure. And in part, because if you look around the world, you know, look at the Fortune 500 companies, the vast majority of them have already made climate pledges. They said they're going to be, you know, carbon neutral in the next couple of decades or so. And so as they try to meet those pledges that they've made to investors or they've made to you know, other shareholders, they need to produce in places that have clean energy matrices. So Latin America could be that place for manufacturing. The other side of it, the sort of the pessimistic side, which I hate to bring up, but I think it's important to put on the table is if Latin America doesn't keep a pretty clean energy matrix, if they don't turn towards you know, a green transition, then they'll be a difficult place for these manufacturers, whether car companies or other advanced manufacturing, it will be a hard place for them to have factories for them to produce. So I think there's a double-edged sword there. Shannon, excellent points. The opportunities are there. It's going to take policy action to take advantage of them. Mauricio Cárdenas, let's turn to you, the issue of Colombia. Colombia in some ways strive to make itself boring, the, to characterize itself as the country that could. Recently, there's been a great deal of excitement on the streets. What's the path forward from the current situation? Well, we have presidential elections next year. I think going back to this initial point that Ricardo was mentioning that there are channels to express the unrest. I think the elections will be the one in Colombia. Um, the radical left will have a strong candidate and will try to capture some of these ideas and, 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 and essentially um, this social explosion. Um, it's yet to be seen whether a, uh, a more centrist, uh, a more Colombian in a traditional way uh, perspective uh, actually wins the majority. I think that's, that's still possible. I, I wouldn't give up on that yet. Um, it needs a lot of coalition forming before that happens, uh, but I think it's possible. I think if anything, the, the explosion that we saw in late April, May, early June, uh, blockades, uh, uh, consequences on the economy, uh, made people very aware uh, that uh, that's not the way to go. People aren't happy about what happened. Um, the country has calmed down a little bit again, and I think uh, that's, that, that, is a, that is good for a centrist uh, perspective because uh, the country doesn't want to be again uh, in a situation where um, essentially uh, there is chaos and anarchy. And, uh, and I think that that probably will help Colombia become boring again. It'll be an interesting signal to the rest of the region and the world to see what happens there. Uh, Ricardo, Venezuela, is there a, an end to this? I mean, um, the th I think that the, the world needs an end to this. Um, uh, the, the negative externalities of the Venezuelan disaster are, are very significant. Uh, you know, they're in, in many areas. We're now upwards of 6 million migrants. Uh, we... Uh, you know, I just saw a picture of, of Venezuela at night, uh, you know, um, our, our flaring of natural gas that we cannot use is, is creates more light than the city of Caracas. Uh, and, you know, it's, uh, it's the most dominant thing at, at night in, in, in Venezuela. So it's an environmental disaster, not only in terms of global warming, but deforestation, uh, pollution with mercury on uh, the through illegal mining, uh, gold mining and uh, you know, it's a crime center, and uh, and you know, the the world is needs um, a mechanism, uh, and I think it's discovering it around Venezuela to say, look, 
if you have a constitution, you don't abide by the constitution, you want to hold power, we won't recognize you. And, and there are some costs that come from non-recognition. I think that that's something that should be on the table for Nicaragua and so on. I think that the world is getting a little bit tired of the Venezuelan story, uh, but, uh, but you know, if it gets tired faster than Maduro, uh, the outcome is, uh, is going to be very bad. So I would say that we need some renewed energy to put uh, Venezuela on the agenda. Uh, every year that passes, every day that passes, it will take longer to, for recovery. The recovery of Venezuela, uh, had it been in you know, 1916, 19, I mean, 2016, 2017, 2018, it would have been much easier than now. Now there's much more destruction of everything, of the human capital, of the physical capital, the institutional capital, and so on. So, so I think that um, a, uh, right now, the situation looks dark, but I think uh, uh, we need uh, we need renewed energy. And I think that uh, uh, what Cuba has shown the world is that uh, there is uh, states can develop enough repressive capacity to shut down their people, and uh, and that there's no no solution to these problems without international involvement. I think a critical point on the need for a renewed set of strategies on international engagement, because in the end, that combination of the domestic potential and the international support is going to be key. And uh, good, uh, thank you for highlight, highlighting that and, and underscoring it. Um, as we close out, I just want to end with uh, the same question for uh, all three of you. And if we can just be brief on this, but given the conversation, many challenges that have been laid out, a few opportunities, but a, and a chance to just highlight um, where you think a critical opportunity or opportunities might lie for the region or those that are looking for investment in the region. Um, and if I can just get a quick response from each of you. Uh, Shannon, let me start with you. Well, I put two on the table, which we've already talked about a bit, but as we look at the big geopolitical changes happening around the world, the two are this quickening of a green transition that we're seeing across governments, particularly the advanced industrial economies, and then this industrial policy that's riding around, and then we're seeing you know people moving supply chains and like, and both of those present huge opportunities for Latin America. One is that Latin America has the basis to become very green economies that will be both investments that would come into the region and help the region, as well as a place where companies can go, as we've talked about. And the other is that the United States in particular, but Europe and others are going to look for secure allies where they can put production. And many, in particular the United States, are not feeling that that is China anymore or other places in Asia. So I think there's a huge opportunity in both of those places that governments and the companies within them can take advantage of. Ricardo? I like I like those very much. I want to stress uh, the, the reason why why this green alternative is important is that uh, renewable energy is much less transportable than fossil fuels. So you need to locate near where it is because you cannot move that energy around. So I think that that's going to relocate energy intensive industries to places that have uh, abundant local renewable energy. So I think that's a theme. Second theme is something we discovered with COVID which is that the many things that we used to do in the office, uh, we can do from home. Well, now we realize that anything that can be done from home can be done from abroad. Uh, and that means that value chains will relocate tasks to places where those tasks can be done more cheaply. And those don't have to be physical. It can, they can be you know, uh, intellectual, they, it can be white collar jobs. So I think that there's going to be a relocation of activities uh, towards these places, I've been doing some numbers. Latin America is has a huge wage differential with the U.S. in many of the professional tasks. So I think that this is uh, uh, another dimension of of the reshoring, if you want, or a nearshoring that that Shannon was talking about. It's really it's really outside of of physical value chains. It's just uh, the tasks that can be done through telework. And Mauricio. Well, I fully agree with uh, with these four ideas that are very much related to business opportunities. So, just not to repeat, let me let me take a different angle and let me talk about political opportunities. I think we're in a tipping point, and uh, and as a result of this uh, COVID crisis, uh, things are not going to be the same 
in, 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 in the region. They could change for the better, they could change for the worse. We can get the, the, the radical leftist, the populist that will try to solve these problems uh, printing money and giving handouts to people, or we can do it in the serious way, which is do the reforms that we haven't done in the past. And, uh, and one very important there is uh, set the ground for inclusive growth. So that means, for example, the region will need to do adjustment. The region, the region has too much debt. Uh, it comes out with, uh, uh, with large deficits from this crisis. Uh, so this is the right time to rethink what the government does, um, remove a lot of government programs that are not effective, and um, repotentiate the ones that are really uh, that will really favor inclusive growth. So this political opportunity, I think, is there. And uh, it's for us Latin Americans to, to seize that. And two, uh, re-engagement with the US. I think this is the right time for, for a new conversation uh, between the region and, and the United States on, on these issues that were just mentioned by Shannon and Ricardo. And I think it's very much for the Biden administration to take the initiative. So many things you've put on the table, phenomenal wisdom that you've laid out. A couple of things just to note. Um, Political activity is a good thing. It's important that you raise that. It's important that people recognize that that ability to express oneself politically as opposed to have that political expression repressed is positive. It's obviously happening in a complicated situation. The point that was made about inclusion and in an economic strategy, I think is, is impressive. It seems so simple and yet at the same time, so fundamental and one of the key indicators to look for the Mauricio, as you suggested, public investment. And in terms of opportunity, this connection between the United States, the region, international investors at an inflection point, not just for the region, but what happens on energy and climate and the whole concept of what it means to be competitive in the 21st century becomes redefined. And here there are opportunities as well, created in part by the shifting of supply chains in part created by the opportunities of green economies. And so even though there are difficulties at the moment, the opportunities are there for those that are able to understand them, grasp and put in place the policy incentives. And from the perspective of companies that are smart in their analysis and understand where to invest because the foundations are there for, pretend, for continued growth into the future. So Shannon, Ricardo, Mauricio, thank you so much for this discussion, sharing your insights and thoughts. It's been a pleasure as always to be with the three of you. Thank you, thank you very Thanks, much. Carlos.